Hi there, thanks for joining us on a QA and a edition of Space Nuts. I'm Andrew Dunkley, your host. Once again, uh, thanks for joining us and um, uh, good to have your company. On this edition, we're uh, answering some questions about light in space. Um, this one comes from Lee. He's, he's asked a very interesting question. I've never actually thought about this particular uh, concept, but uh, it's, a, it's a question that I think is worth answering for sure. That's why we included it. Fenton wants to know about um, shielding astronauts in the outer reaches of the solar system, and he's got an idea on how to do that. Uh, Robert wants to uh, talk about things we learn from the moon, and what if our moon wasn't the same as the moon is now, would our learnings be different? That's a really interesting question. And Duncan wants to talk about ice giants and why are they ice giants? Why don't we call them something else? That's all coming up shortly on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. report, it feels good. Once again, we welcome the one and only Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How have you been since we last spoke? Um, I haven't moved from this seat in all that time. <laughs> Well, it's I know it's uh, I can see you glued to your chair there. Um, very much, am I, actually. very yes. much so. <laughs> yes. Uh, shall we get um, straight into it and answer some questions from our audience? Uh, we uh, will. That's a good idea. Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's, that's what we're here for. This first one, Fred, comes from Lee. He lives in New York City. Uh, he's he's asking how much light is in space. He'll qualify that question. For example. If you were to visit Voyager 1, where Voyager 1 is today, would you be able to see it? Would you see just a silhouette? Would you be able to make out details and colours if there are, if there are, uh, are any colours on it? Uh, what about if uh, you and Voyager were midway between the Sun and Alpha Centauri? Uh, can we know a reasonably accurate answer or is it pure speculation? Thanks, love the show, Lee from New York. I, I've never thought about that. I mean, we take for granted light on Earth because it's you know, we're illuminated by the sun, but it's it's a bit different in other parts of the solar system and the universe in general. So, yeah, if we could just go snap, we're out there next to Voyager 1, could we actually see it? Is it illuminated in any way? Is it being illuminated by something? What would it be like? Uh, the answer is yes, you'd see it. Um, and... Um, so we're talking really now about the sensitivity of the human eye, mm. uh, because uh, with a with a camera, uh, you know, um, with long exposure settings and things, you'd be able to see it in great detail. But thinking about the human eye, so um, I used to work, as you know, at Siding Spring Observatory. Uh, I spent many hours. Uh, outside at night there. It is a place that is truly dark. There's no uh, interference from street lights. Uh, th there are a few blobs of light on the horizon, but nothing that affects the pristine darkness of the night sky. And on a starry night with the sun not in the sky, you can see quite clearly um, there's enough light from the stars themselves to let you see where you're going, uh, let you, you know, walk around and be quite confident that you're not going to fall off the mountain as I nearly did one night when it was uh, cloudy. I went out without my torch and thought, oh yeah, I'll see by the stars. But fortunately, unfortunately, the cloud had come in. I couldn't see anything and I nearly fell, over, fell off the mountain. Um, yeah. I didn't in the end, but... Um, that's, a lot, so, that's a long drop for me. Yes, it is. Yes, it's quite a long drop. Anyway, uh, if you, uh, you know, normally on a starry night, you will see... Um, by the light of the stars. Now, where Voyager is, Voyager 1, uh, I just looked it up, uh, it is uh, at a distance from the sun in astronomical units, which is 163 astronomical units. That's 163 times the number of uh, times the distance between the Earth and the sun. So that's 150 million kilometres. Multiply that by 163, and you will get, uh, what do you get? Uh, I was looking for it in kilometres, but it's not there. I'll have to do the numbers. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The main thing is, um, its distance is 22.55 light hours away. 
Uh, that's how long it takes uh, the signal to get from Voyager to Earth. It's almost a day. It's almost a light day away. Um, so at that distance from the sun, 160-odd astronomical units, uh, there's still significant light coming from the sun, not to mention Venus uh, and, um, you know, uh, Jupiter and uh, the other planets. Mostly the sun, though, you'd... You're being illuminated by the sun, so that certainly ups it uh, as compared with just being illuminated by the starry sky, which is what I was just talking about. So you'd see it really clearly. Uh, you wouldn't have any problem making it out, assuming your eye was dark adapted. Mm. So it's um, it's fairly bright out there. I mean, we, we talked about the sensitivity of the human eye, as uh, you, you referred to. How, how small amount of light can we see as human beings? Um, I think there were some experiments. Let me think. Was, it, was it one photon or one pixel yes, or something were, like that? There was. That's right. Uh, we might have talked about this. There were experiments done that showed that the human eye is capable of detecting single photons. Uh, mm. It was under special circumstances, but uh, and that is just extraordinary. Um, when you think that the human eye can also cope with broad daylight. That's the amazing thing about the human eye. It can, you know, it's quite happy uh, to see light uh, at one brightness and then a light that's only a millionth of as bright. Um, yeah. It's fine. You can deal with that. And that's a combination of what's called retinal bleaching and the, the iris of your eye opening and closing. It's all those things come together to give you this unbelievably versatile and sensitive tool with which we can look at the uh, mm -hmm. our surroundings, whether it's uh, the, the rock face I'm looking at now, because that's what our backyard consists of, or whether it's, uh, you know, the night sky where you're looking at faint objects uh, in the sky. It's quite yes. amazing. So even if you went deeper into space, way beyond our solar system, you, you would probably still see objects yeah. that you were near. There'd be enough light from the stars. The Milky Way uh, is is bright. Uh, it would it would, you know, even if as as uh, as Lee says, if, even if you were halfway between the Sun and Alpha Centauri, you'd still see it because of the ambient light uh, that's coming from from the stars. Yeah, and you'd still see colour because that's what, well, yeah. if it's dark enough, it might turn into the greys, which happens it, at that's night. That's right. But... Yeah, mm. and I think that's likely. I think it, I don't think you would see colour. Um, you yeah. would. You would where it is now. There's enough light coming from the sun that you'd see colour. But I think uh, when you got further out, you would start to just see the, the you know, the, as you said, the, that fit, that sort of pale grey appearance where you're looking at very low light, low light levels indeed, where the colour cells aren't receptive. Mm. There you go, Lee. Uh, the answer to your question is yes to all of the above, basically. Mm. Yeah. Uh, good question, great though. question. Excellent yeah. question. All right, let's move on. This is from Fenton. Yeah, hello, Fred and Andrew. This is Fenton contacting you from St. Paul, Minnesota in the U.S. Um, I sort of have a different type of astrophysical question for you, and this is on how to shield astronauts from radiation outside of the Van Allen belt. Um, I was curious if you know of any pending technologies that would allow this. Obvious choice, would some people would say, is lead, but I can think of several reasons why this is not a good idea. How about a miniature Van Allen belt, which could surround a spacecraft? How does that sound? How could this become a reality? Thank you very much. I hope you liked the question. Bye now. Thanks, Fenton. Fenton always has these intriguing thoughts, I, I've noticed, in the times that we've heard from him. Um, maybe we should start by explaining what the Van Allen belt is for those of us who just can't remember, like me. <laughs> um, it's uh, it, so the Van Allen belt, so the, basically the, um, the, the, you know, the magnetic shielding around the Earth, uh, which is... Uh, caused by the the magnetism of the earth it's caused by the uh, the fact that we've got an iron core and uh, a, a, basically it's in two parts it's solid and liquid so it acts like a dynamo it's rotating and that gives us this uh, exactly the protection that um, 
that um, um, Fenton is talking about. Um, yeah. I was going to refer... I'm a bit annoyed, actually, because I've lost it. Uh, there is a very nice article on... Uh, it's actually on the um, BBC's website, uh, their Sky at Night website. There's a lovely article on exactly this. Here it is. I found it. I haven't lost it. How Astronauts Can Hide from Radiation on Mars. And it goes into uh, the exactly the problem that, uh, that Fenton's talking about. How do you present, how do you prevent um, astronauts basically becoming irradiated? Uh, and over time, it's basically lethal uh, because, because of the cosmic radiation that's coming down through space uh, and it, it does cell damage uh, in your body. Uh, and it can actually trigger cancer. So um, the the whole study of this is, uh, or the, sorry, the, the thrust of this article, BBC Sky at Night magazine, uh, is to dis discuss how you might protect astronauts uh, from the radiation. Uh, and that's not just on Mars, but en route. Uh, okay. Uh, the solution that, that Fenton has suggested is covered in a paragraph. I'm going to read it because we quoted where the source is. Uh, for example, all right, let me no, let me go back a bit. Paragraph one. One method of helping astronauts to avoid the radiation on Mars is active shielding. For example, superconducting electromagnets could be used to create a powerful magnetic field to deflect the incoming charged radiation particles away, just as the Earth's field does. That's the Van, Van Allen belts. The problem is that such solutions can demand a lot of power to run, and the technology is a long way from being fully developed. An easier alternative is passive shielding, simply placing a thick bulk of shielding material between the crew habitat and the sky. Uh, and then they go on to consider different materials. Aluminium, aka aluminium, uh, the metal that spacecraft are constructed from is actually a pretty bad radiation shield. Um, and they say when hit by an energetic cosmic ray, its atoms can shatter and fly onwards to create even more radiation particles. And Martian soil, the regolith, uh, which if you're on Mars, you might think about digging a hole there. Uh, it's got the same problem, but it's it's actually, uh, you know, abundant. Um, and so you could use that to dig a pole if you put a two to three metre layer on top of your habitat. Uh, then you'll you'll get some protection. But uh, the thing that surprised me, Andrew, uh, is once again it comes from this same article. Uh, hydrogen is the best shielding material, as it's exactly. light atoms. Yeah, it's light atoms, uh, and by light I mean not heavy. It's light atoms don't create as much secondary radiation, and so tanks of rocket fuel or water, which is rich in hydrogen placed over crew quarters could double up as effective radiation shields. Uh, I've heard that before, that um, no. you know, one way of protecting your spacecraft as it flies to Mars is put it, put it in a tank of water. Uh, it's the last thing you'd expect to do, but uh, water is a good shielding material. And they also mm. uh, point out the alternative of hydrogen-rich plastics like polyethylene could be used to cement regolith grains together. This is on Mars and improve their shielding effect. Um, so uh, if you want to read more about this, it's an article that originally appeared in the August 22, 2022 issue of BBC Sky at Night magazine. And it covers pretty well most of the ideas uh, that, have been, that have been suggested for this radiation issue. It's one that's got to, you know, it's got to find an answer soon because uh, <laughs> good old Elon and his starship uh, is getting nearer to thinking about going to Mars. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but um, that's... Uh, uh, that's something he'll definitely be thinking about. Yes, indeed. Oh, he's, got, he's too busy dealing with the Australian government at the moment. He is over, indeed. Um, that's, that's right. Over some indeed. of the content on Twitter that the government wants to get rid of simply because yeah. of its um, volatility. But anyway, that's a different story. Uh, but there's plenty of water on Mars, so maybe maybe creating yeah. those water barriers is, is probably the simplest thing to do. You've already got the material there. If you've if you've um, landed in the right spot where you've got permafrost yeah, or whatever, that's yeah. the question. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, well done, Fenton. Fenton, you, you actually happened across some of the uh, the answers too in uh, asking your question. 
Uh, this is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, our next question comes from Robert. Hi, guys. Love your show. Sorry for the long question, but feel free to paraphrase uh, or shorten it. Our moon is heavily cratered and has given us a lot of insight into the history of the solar system and perhaps how the planets formed. But what if we had a moon like the icy moon Europa or the shrouded uh, in haze Titan, both of which don't show immediate evidence of cratering? Would our theory about uh, how the planets developed would uh, be different? What other insights about our solar system would be missing uh, or would we be missing? And lastly, uh, would we have spent uh, or would we have sent people to land on such moons, i.e. Uh, would they be more dangerous for astronauts? Uh, cheers, Robert in Vienna, Austria. Wow, I don't think we've had a question from Vienna before, have we? Lovely to hear uh, from you, Robert. I think I think Robert might have been in touch once before. I can't oh, remember. I might have been too. Yeah, it's because, very rare um, to hear from Vienna. <laughs> yeah, I was in Vienna at the beginning of last year, and I think I think we got something around about the same time, and I was oh, okay. waxing okay. lyrical about being in Vienna at the UN when I was at the COP plus meeting. Anyway, uh, that's another another issue. Uh, what if we had a? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, what would we not know? about the solar system if our moon was basically uh, one that had been resurfaced in recent years or yeah. recent millennia, uh, because that's what makes the surface smooth. That's how we recognize um, the fact that the universe, sorry, that the, it's how we recognize the age of a surface is by how many craters it's got. The older, the older the surface, the more craters it has. And so the moon's south, southern region, which is heavily cratered, as is the backside, uh, tell us that uh, early on in the solar system's history, it was a very wild and woolly place with things charging about all over and causing these craters. Now, if we had a moon that was like Europa, that um, had, you know, a, a icy geysers on it that basically covered up the craters, would we have known about that? My guess is, yes, we would, because we'd see other bodies within the solar system, uh, like, you know, other moons, like um, places like um, uh, Ceres, the, the biggest of the asteroids, the dwarf planet that dominates the asteroid belt. That's heavily cratered. Uh, parts of Pluto are heavily cratered. Um, 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 uh, Mimas, uh, one of Saturn's moon is, moons is heavily cratered too. So so we'd, we'd know about it by looking at other objects, even if our own moon was uh, smoothly surfaced. Um, mm. It's, it's uh, but the Robert's last point uh, on this, uh, would we have sent people to land on such a moon? Uh, I think, um, I don't know, that's a really good question. I mean, we have sent people to land on our moon as it stands. Uh, with an ancient surface. It, in fact, where they landed were more recent uh, than the heavily cratered surfaces because they were principally in the Maria, the, the, the basalt plains. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that suggests that we would have landed people on Europa as well. Uh, because I, I think got... we probably, yeah, we probably would because yeah. it would have a solid surface. There'd be places because it would be so close to us, we'd be able to examine and, and find the, the, the right landing points. Might be a bit more difficult with a moon that's shrouded in layers of gas. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. That's right, uh, and especially um, a place like Titan. Uh, uh, I, I still think we'd have done it. Actually, I think um, you know the JFK's uh, promise to put astronauts on the moon would have still held good, even if it had been a very different place. If it had been like EO, uh, it might have been a different story where, you know, you've got the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system with stuff going off all over the place. I think we might have been a bit more reluctant to, to land on EO. Yes, possibly so. But uh, it would be interesting to have something different. But then if we'd always had, if we, if we'd always had an ice moon, we probably would have caught a question from uh, Robert asking, what if we had a rocky moon? <laughs> yeah. Now, would we, <laughs> would, we know, 
What if we, would we have a different <laughs> yeah. interpretation of the four masses and planets if there was a rocky moon next to us instead of an ice moon? Yes. Um, in an alternative universe, Robert, you would have flipped your question. Good yeah. to hear from you. Hope all, all is well in Austria. Our final question for this episode comes from Duncan. Hello. So Duncan here from Weymouth in the UK. Again, a quick question. <laughs> Just looking... I was just doing some reading, and I noticed that Uranus and Neptune are often referred to as ice giants. Now, given that ice is basically just sort of like a rock form of water or CO2 or whatever else, but basically just the solid form of it, why are they not just called rock giants? Why do we make the definition of ice rather than just calling them rock it just seems odd because the little planets in the inner solar system are referred to as rocky planets so given that they're also apparently rocky why are they not called rocky giants okay thank you bye Thanks, Duncan. Appreciate your questions as always. Uh, yeah, why do we call them ice giants just for the sake of the exercise? Because there's gas giants and ice giants. Yeah. yeah, except one is a subset of the other. And so all four of the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, sorry, Uranus and Neptune, they're all gas giants because they have uh, high mass, uh, um, you know, much more in the case of Jupiter, certainly, than, uh, than our own planet. Um, the, they've got they're, they're giants, they're big, they've got high mass, uh, and they don't have a visible surface, which is why they're called gas giants, because all we see is a gassy envelope. Um, just to go to the last of Duncan's questions there, we, we wouldn't call the inner planets rocky giants because they're not giants they're kind of normal planet size you know if you if you think of the earth as being your standard planet then uh, mercury and venus and mars are similar in size they're all smaller venus is about the same size but mercury and mars of course are smaller so uh so it's only when you compare with the size of earth that you'd start talking about giants because they're much much bigger than earth and so that's the gas giants so why are Uranus and Neptune called ice giants? Because they have hazes of ice in their atmosphere. So, uh, and that's the, the trick. It's not a solid surface. It's not rock. It's, it's a haze. It's kind of like a, a dust of ice which permeates their atmosphere. And, and, and it's water ice, in fact, uh, mostly. Uh, so... That's why they're called ice giants, because unlike Saturn and Jupiter, uh, which don't have these hazes, uh, the, the, outer, the rocky, rocky, sorry, the two outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, do. They have ice hazes in their atmosphere, hence the name. Okay. Yeah. And of course, the last episode, we learned there wasn't much water in Jupiter's no, atmosphere. that's right. That's, that's in, the, right. Uh, in the two outer gas giants... Yeah, it sounds like there is. Is that why they're a different colour? Yes. Yes, I think that's right. They're, um, and, and also their, their atmospheric constituents are, are different. They don't have the same belt structure that Saturn and Jupiter do. Uh, it may be that that's because any belts that exist are, are much lower in the atmosphere, and so you don't see them. Um, mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, there's a strong body of uh, of advocacy within the space fraternity to get get a, a more spacecraft out to Uranus and Neptune because they're the two planets a, a, about which we know least um, and uh, will be good to know more. Yeah. Well, if you sit down in snow for long enough, Uranus turns into an ice giant. <laughs> so, I, I couldn't help it. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which is why we call it Uranus in polite circles. Yes, I know, I know. Yeah, but it's just, it's just a joke you've got to tell. It's just, yeah, no, you have I mean, to. Yeah. I, yes, I, I blame Johannes Boda, who is the person who chose the name. It's fine in German. Uranus, Uranus, there's nothing wrong oh, with that word. German. That's, but, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Ruins all the jokes, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yes, uh, they're ice giants for a very good reason, Duncan, because they've got ice in them. 
uh, in the atmosphere, but uh, technically speaking, they are in fact gas giants. But yes, yeah, we differentiate them because of their substantially different atmospheres. There you are. Thanks, Duncan. Great to hear from you. Great uh, to hear from everybody. Thanks for sending in your questions. Don't forget, you can send in questions via our website, spacenutspodcast.com, spacenuts.io, and all you have to do is click on the various links on the right-hand side. Send us your question. That's audio questions only, uh, or you can send us text and audio questions via the AMA tab up the top. It's your choice. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from and have a look around while you're on our website. Uh, or join our media, uh, social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, where you can subscribe just by pre pressing the subscribe <laughs> button below, which, yes, it's down there somewhere. I don't know. One of those places. Uh, Fred, as always, thank you so much. Pleasure, Andrew. See you soon. Okay. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, we'll catch him on the next episode of Space Nuts. We might catch Hugh then as well because um, not here today. Didn't even call in sick. I need a note. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks very much for your company. We'll see you again soon on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.